in the process of, of getting our 501c3. Uh, as Mark had said before, we, we hope that the spirit of what we're trying to do here does not preclude someone from making a donation if they are so inclined anyway. But, but we are doing our best to, uh, to get our own 501c3 status. Well, our next guest presenter helps to balance out our, our slate of speakers in that we've, we've talked very much about emerging new energy technologies. But new energy movement also is highly supportive of all clean, renewable technologies, especially ones that are ready right now. And Martin Berger, the, the president, CEO, and founder of Blue Energy Canada is going to present his own experiences in that realm and about a technology that is available and that is, is trying to gain some momentum. And so I'm proud to introduce to you Martin Berger. Thank you, and I, I want to acknowledge uh, the, the inspiration and the hope that that uh, Dr. Brian O'Leary, Steve and Joel, my friend Gene Manning. This new movement is, is critically important and we've lost our way a bit and wandered around in some of, the, some of the briar bushes in the new and renewable energy movement over the years. And it's time now to focus and get some, get some traction. There's been a lot of wheel spinning and I think when we look back uh, to 1896, John Keeley's earlier invention with the Keeley's Dinosphere, the work that Dale Pond's been doing to try and figure out just what old John was doing, I think is very admirable, but, but it's time. Uh, it's, it's not so much whether we deserve free energy or whether we're consciously or spiritually ready for it. It's just a function of attention. My good friend Hazel Henderson on our advisory board says, we live in the attention economy. And the problem with accessing these idealized futures is a function of attention. I, I submit that our future is given where we put our attention, primarily where we put our fears, unfortunately, but that's just part of the learning process. And it's time we put humanity's attention on the potential of what's possible. I think I'm, I'm totally expired by free or inspired by free energy devices and I'd like to have a 10 kilowatt in my shirt pocket. There's a lot of things I could do. I would like 600 horsepower in my, my SUV as well. That's human nature and that's our spirit. It's not to go back to the Cro-Magnon cave with a match and a flint. So I think we can have our cake and eat it, our energy cake and eat it too. I'm very inspired by the, 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 the unblocking, if you would, of the energy pipeline. Yes, the energy pipeline has been blocked for some 60 to 80 years, but there are concerted efforts to bring that blockage out, the draino, if you would, uh, of the vested interest gridlock. And, and I don't buy into the conspiratorial tones that, that uh, some of the preceding speakers have spoken to. I am not a victim. I was into the conspiracy side of the new energy movement for a while, and I found that my experience was then, uh, there was a vehicle homicide attempt. Here was a vehicle that crossed three lanes of traffic to run me down at a crosswalk. I thought, oh, just a random act of kindness on a Saturday night or a Friday night. But I was accosted by the three individuals in that car uh, two or three blocks later. Uh, they were laying for me in wait as I approached my car and then kicked the bejesus out of me to, the, to near death. And uh, I got up from that, and that was a real wake-up call. Yes, there have been laboratories vandalized, but I submit those people in those laboratories brought that on. I am not a victim, and inventors have to be mature to where they avoid that experience. We create these experiences, and it's about focusing our attention and creating the ones that we are of our choosing. The, I spoke yesterday briefly about about the, the enemy are us, if you would. And that is really where the promise of the new energy movement is, is that we will engage. This will become a clearinghouse for information. It will be that information portal that people need to engage. I also submit that it has to get worse. 
That's just our nature. What is it going to take for us to wake up? Those are the things that I'm concerned about. Yes, we will get there, but again, it's how we get there. And the futures are given by where we put our attention and where we put our emotions, our feelings and our desires. And unfortunately, also where we put our fears. So this calls on us to be leaders and to advance this agenda. And I submit again that the transition technologies, we've seen the wind and photovoltaics to date, uh, have got us a great start. But unfortunately, they didn't have the resource densities. I think a windmill is just one of the most marvelous contraptions ever conceived. They're beautiful. I love them. But if they only had some density in the fluid medium, where we could get higher torques with smaller devices, if the wind was predictable, that would make a better windmill technology and it would improve the bottom line. They wouldn't need subsidies. There's, a, there's, an emotion, there's the ocean energy movement taking hold right now in Scotland and, and in the UK. And in the, in the UK, they've spent $100 million, $100 million on preliminary tidal power development. That's the resource assessments, the pre-feasibility, the grid interfacing, the, the ecological uh, impact assessments. All of that work has already been laid and they understand that that is going to be our future for some time. And I think in North America, we, we risk lagging behind that. The EU will be using this technology and then benefiting from the trillion dollars of spin-offs. And that's what these, these large financial commitments that are being made today by Scotland, Portugal, and, the, and the, again, the UK, the DTI at the UK, some now 350 million pounds. And so if North America is going to participate in this a very exciting emerging era of the high density and ultra high density area, we have to get on it. And blue energy is a technology. I'm proud to say that uh, it's taken us, well, I'm not so proud to say it's taken us a while. It's, it was invented, if you would, back in the 20s. Some of the uh, main patents went in the public domain in the 30s. And, and I've been at it for 15 years. It, I think the problem with most of the energy efforts this century has been either proponent inventor or CEO fatigue. And I grew up in a place where we didn't use the word quit very often because it was 50 below and if you quit often that would result in a popsicle in about 20 minutes. <laughs> so I didn't learn the word and after 15 years if that's the preliminaries let's get at it. So that's where we're at at Blue Energy with six working prototypes we're ready to do our first commercial demonstration of the technology. We've got a high profile project in conjunction with the Vancouver Aquarium and, and Stanley Park and yes our Prime Minister Paul Martin made a very bold a uh, visionary move and, and a statement to, to the world when he said, we're going to sell our stake in Petro-Canada and put that money into uh, forward-looking new energy technologies and build a new prosperity for Canada. <laughs> this didn't happen uh, just one night where he had a, an inspiration and decided to take this on. This has uh, been legions and legions of people uh, working and lobbying and, and an endless lobbying and networking. But it's resulted in a climate, a climate that's got a lot of promise and it looks like a fair amount of money. I don't, I don't think the capitalist system is so flawed that the greed motivation uh, has become dysfunctional. If a technology is a sound technology, it's got sound management about it, it will get funded. And it's not a question so much of a technology or the funding. It's more a function of the enabling field. Mark spoke so eloquently of the cosmology here. Yes, we are in D1. I think next week up in Seattle, there's a conference celebrating the legacy of Chief Seattle. That, that hit a nerve. <clears throat> Chief Seattle said we're all one with the web of life.
and as one, and as the leaders of this movement, let's put our attention on these solutions. The environmentalists, I think, failed us this century, and that it was a great start. And the, and the movement washed out because they didn't, they didn't shift from the problem perspective to the solutions. The solutions are there. Let's pick one, even if it's the wrong one. Try it, learn from it, go on from it. I think, I think when we talk about the range of technologies out there, the zero point, the vacuum energy uh, technologies, I think we're gonna see them uh, in this attention spectrum of consciousness. I think the computer revolution, if you would, the personal laptop, laptop that Bill, Bill Gates visited on us with about 20, 20 times the, the productivity gains as well. I think that was spawned in the movies that Hollywood did about Dr. Doom and these big computers. And he, missed, he, he, he made a, a mystery about computers and attracted and accumulated everybody's attention. And it was that preceding work that gave rise to the computing digital revolution. The same work must be done here with this movement to create this experience. The experience is out there in its potential right now, but it will not be a realized potential until our attention and our emotions and our desires have been focused on it and we win that gravitational mass of consciousness and then that experience will be ours. I submit again that the Emerging technologies and ocean energy technologies are a very important midway point to the zero-point energies. And that we will be able to uh, move to this free energy and prosper or prosperous uh, cosmology that, again, Mark so eloquently put. I've got a, a, a lot of information in a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to go through it quite rapidly and uh, try and provide enough space for the follow-up speakers to present their their technologies. This is a, a, an animation showing climate change and the planet is heating up from a number of natural phenomena as well as man-made man phenomena. This is an animation showing the shrinking and the thinning of the polar ice cap. I grew up in this country, in, the, in Canada's uh, Arctic and subarctic regions. And we've seen a 50% thinning of the three meter thickness that was there 45 years ago. And rudimentary thermal dynamics will tell you, if you just look at your next drink and the ice cube, your first ice mass loss is your slowest ice mass loss. Your second ice mass loss is much faster. There are trillions of tons of stored methane inert while they're frozen, but when it melts, it will become an absorptive surface where we've inadvertently melted the planet's cooling mirror. And this is going to have disastrous consequences, including the possible shutting down of the Florida Gulf Stream. Have we got some audio on this? This is a graph showing uh, 400, and 20,000 years of trace, trace gas ice core data, the paleontology record, and what the planet looked like. And with oxygen isotope analysis, we've been able to correlate a seasonal uh, temperature uh, a correlation for this data set. It's a complete data set. We started our industrial age at a peak, unfortunately, then we've added to it. The Pentagon report advises Bush that climate change will destroy us. The secret report warns of rioting and nuclear war. Britain will be Siberian in less than 20 years. Threat to the world is greater than that in terrorism. But, uh, Tony Blair's scientific advisor, Sir King, uh, also warned that uh, climate change is, is a greater threat than, than uh, even terrorism. The Union of Concerned Scientists warns that we've already irreversibly altered the ecology and that we may have already set ourselves on a perilous course. It may be as well that we've forestalled the solutions to where the transition will be disruptive. Blue Energy's here to share what's possible.
It's the best planet I know of. Our vision at Blue Energy is lighting up the world with blue energy. The mission is to commercialize Blue Energy's technology and lead the world in energy sustainability. There's a paradigm shift, the new energy economy. It's apparent that the energy choices that served us in the past no longer serve us in the same way today. Energy sources like nuclear, thermal, and dams are facing opposition worldwide. These are the energy the convergent drivers driving our commercialization program forward. Rising energy demand. We're going to be using four or five times as much energy per capita as we are right now, 50 years from now. And there'll be 10 or 15 billion, billion people using that amount of energy. It, it really defines a sophisticated culture and we're going to get more sophisticated. It's just our nature. Previous renewables have fallen short because they lack the necessary density, efficiency, and scalability to meet the massive energy needs of the world. The life support system of the planet is at risk. Our new choices must be sustainable. For those of us who can make a dollar and a difference, it's time we did so now. Massive convergent market forces are causing paradigm shifts, providing lucrative opportunities for new companies to enter the marketplace. Companies that can provide high density sustainable sources will be the winners in this new energy economy. Why ocean energy? 70% of the planet is covered in ocean. 66% of the world's population live within 100 miles of its coasts. This is a massive, untapped natural energy resource. This is the tidal model when we unwrap it from the globe and lay it out flat and animate it. The pink and the red is the cumulative gravitational attractor force from the sun and the moon, called the M1 and the M2 tidal constituents. And as this high water cycles against the islands and inlets, we have an inrushing tide and then the ebb tide as it recedes. And it's predictable. You can set your watch by this model 20 years in the future. There are some 30 ocean energy technologies out there um, trying to capture this high density resource and convert it with commercial extraction efficiencies. There's a lot of different methods. And I think they're all worthy of, of our support. This is an early tidal power installation at Laurence in France. The French uh, used the Kaplan turbine, basically a, a low head bulb turbine, and built an ocean going dam. Unfortunately, it was very expensive, and the, environmentalist, and the environmentalists rightly criticized it as having a heavy ecological footprint. Fortunately, new tidal, new, new tidal power technology has a much lighter ecological footprint. It doesn't involve, involve impoundment schemes, so you have the natural ebb and flow of the estuary, and it's a much lighter uh, capital cost. We estimate some 50 to 200 percent of the world's energy needs can be, very safely uh, be extracted from the ocean. It was just minuscule peripheral amounts of the whole energy system in the ocean. You wouldn't be dominating it at all. And I think that's very important for all the Schauberger uh, students in the room that share Victor Schauberger's sentiments about dominating these hydraulic systems. Until now, no one has found a cost-effective and environmental way to harness the mass of energy in the oceans. Blue Energy has a new technology proven through six uh, prototype trials. Uh, here are two size classes. There's a micro class that we, we developed with four or five units uh, in the proof of concept trials. Uh, we haven't been able to find a way at this stage to monetize a business case, but this is, again, something very promising for the future. They, do, they definitely work, but there's significant amounts of capital to achieve the economies of scale, so they're readily available on your Kmart shelf. Uh, the larger unit is on the right-hand side is a 250 kilowatt unit, and there's a 120 scale model over in the corner built by Dr. Sergei Barnachev from the Russian rocket program. This is a, a technology that will be uh, rolled out in the coastal diesel market niche initially, 
and in three or four years from the rollout, we'll achieve grid economies of scale as well. Now, the tidal fence you see on the left is the larger uh, uh, technology size class. It ranges from 200 megawatts to 1,000 megawatts. There are larger uh, tidal systems than that as well we have designs for. India has recently proposed a tidal barrier uh, in the Bay of Cambay, similar to what the French did in Lawrence. And, and Blue Energy and Bechtel are likely to be the power value proposition in our proposal where we would put a tidal fence across. This will be about a $20 billion project, so uh, there's some very large applications for the technology as well. The origins of the technology go back to the 20s with the French theoretician uh, uh, Darius. Uh, Darius conceived of it for wind and also hydraulic applications, and we've seen uh, the wind people use it in Sacramento and other places uh, in the egg beater uh, windmill design. It, it makes a very good hydraulic application and we've developed it using astro aerospace physics and science uh, into a very efficient device. Our extraction efficiencies are some 45 percent water to wire right now and we uh, in our advanced rotor design program foresee 65 to 70 percent extraction efficiencies. Aerodynamics and hydrodynamics are essentially first cousins in physics. Advanced aerospace designs causes these foils to move up to six times faster than the speed of the water. Seawater is a non-compressible fluid medium and some 832 times denser than air. Eight knots of moving seawater has the wind force equivalent of about two Hurricane Ivans. This is a simple schematic showing the resultant vector, but it's high density seawater passing through these rotors uh, creates this large lift force and is uh, converted to rotational torque on a shaft which turns a gearbox into a generator. It's a major technical breakthrough, low cost, low impact, scalable, and I think what's well, what is unique about this technology and very exciting is its multiple infrastructure. It, it, it's a transportation bridge solution as well as an energy sustainable low cost uh, energy solution. And, and I say this is very important because this energy innovation uh, sector suffers from acute uh, innovation erectile dysfunction. <laughs> it, it, it does not constitute and hasn't constituted an enabling field for any of these emerging technologies going back the last hundred years. And I think if we're going to rely on this field as an enabling field for emerging technologies, we're going to be uh, frustrated and spinning our wheels another 50 years into this. It'll be the bridge people looking for transportation solutions with a, with a lucrative energy revenue stream that will drive this system 40 to 50 billion dollars into the space before the thrusters, if you would, will ignite from the uh, energy utility sector. And this is the reason it's exciting. It's some 200 times the density in a qualitative analysis of solar and wind and the waves. The wave people are, are achieving greater densities and greater extraction efficiencies, but blue energies almost 200 times. It will be very competitive. I'm in a strategic partnership conversation some 18 months old with the people at Alcoa. Alcoa, to be considered as a viable, sustainable energy option for Alcoa, you have to be able to reach and achieve two cents a kilowatt and they agree that our system will likely give them that aluminum smelter price point. This is some of the early R&D work. This is a, a flume in the NR, NRC's hydraulics lab in Ottawa, and the design evolved from a three-bearing, three or sorry, a, a single-bearing, three-foil blade design, and uh, it's gone on to four and five foil, foils on the rotor right now. The top left, there's a 100 kilowatt unit that was tested. On the top right, a very interesting little device produced 42 kilowatts, a five by eight duct, and that was a three blade design. And then there's a small four kilowatt unit which you could use in a stream that was toad tested in the Florida Gulf Stream. 
six prototypes tested successfully in all. The proof of concept is behind us, and we're now just engineering it for its uh, rigorous uh, commercial uh, continuity of service supply ap uh, application. Independent technical validations have been made of this technology, and it's ready for commercialization. This is from Dr. Bruce Pratt saying extensive testing has shown the system works as, as we've described it. This is my founding partner, Mr. Barry Davis. Unfortunately, Mr. Davis died uh, last December, another one of the great inventors of this century that passed, uh, passed on into the other realms. And uh, fortunately, we've preserved the design continuity with the loss of Mr. Davis, but I was saddened as his founding partner uh, to see that he committed his whole life to the extent that he did and the sacrifices that he paid and his family paid and that he didn't live to see the fruits of his efforts. He was the aerospace designer on the Avro Arrow. In 1959, the Avro Arrow would outfly the F-18 Hornet today in speed, altitude and range, a very significant aerospace pinnacle engineering achievement. And then he was the chief hydrodynamicist on a project, a lesser known project, but equally interesting and a pinnacle engineering achievement in the Bador 400. The Bador 400 was 225 ton, 151 foot in length, and did some 65 knots, that's about 80 miles an hour, in Sea State 5, about 14, 15 feet out of the water. Darth Vader's ski boat, if there ever was one. Uh, moving from the, the slide rule sort of uh, the beginnings of the technology, we're now into sophisticated computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis with uh, design tools uh, with Dr. Sergei Barmachev from the Russian rocket program and at one point Emmanuel Grillos from uh, Boeing's uh, Harrier jump jet uh, X-32 program was on the design team. Together they collaborated in the very successful uh, joint venture Boeing uh, Moscow uh, sea launch program. Uh, Dr. David Swan was a protege of uh, Mr. Barry Davis and went on to be the, the lift expert that did the Helios Flying Wing. The Helios Flying Wing is a solar-powered electric motor uh, air, air vehicle and unmanned vehicle, and it would make an excellent uh, uh, lower satellite uh, platform for many applications. Uh, arguably uh, the best execution of lift uh, in aerospace this century. Uh, intellectual property, Blue Energy Leverage is about $300 million in naval intellectual property. We have the exclusive marketing and licensing rights, system patent application with 21 patent claims, new state-of-the-art patent applications, uh, quite a file of those right now. And we're in the possession of the world's largest information library on vertical axis hydro hydraulic turbine technology. Dr. Patrick Bailey has got a, a clearinghouse uh, for new inventions in energy systems. And out of 114 systems in a, in a paper in Hawaii, he ranked uh, the Blue Energy System number one for its commercial readiness. This is a, a 250 kilowatt unit, semi-neutrally buoyant on pilings. And those are counter-rotating as we've shown in the model. Here's the tidal fence. We call this to the bridge to our energy future. And here's a, a digital animation that shows you a bird's eye view of the operation looking down through the water and then submarines into the underwater view. This is a thin shell marine caisson, gravity based system, sits on a rock fill, rock fill bed. They turn at 25 to 27 RPM. There's no mash points to kill fish or marine life. You can shut them down in, a, in just a, a half of or a third of a revolution of the rotor with a sonic shutdown device, acoustic. This one was designed for 150 mile an hour winds like they're experiencing in Florida this week in San Bernardino Strait in the Philippines. And so the roadways and the transportation side of it and the superstructure are embedded in the, in the top. The whole string is removable from the bottom bearing uh, with these uh, rolling gantry cranes on the top. And it's a, a Lego block system, it's very simple. And this is one of the Lego block pieces. You pour the base in a, in a dry dock and then when it's got enough wall clearance that it will float, you tow that out and then you do a live extrusion to the top, a very efficient concrete pour, a half meter uh, thin shell marine caisson design 
and then the superstructure on the top. It's towed to the site with the prepared bed and just sunk and put into place and commissioned. I'm the founding CEO of Blue Energy. Matt Campbell is our advising CFO, Jack Wilson. Our construction manager, Branka Hayes, will be involved in the project management. And Clayton Bear from Novacor's Maglev Bearing Program uh, will be heading up the development. Uh, large power projects are very complex uh, engineering and capital finance uh, efforts. And this group here, a seasoned group of uh, shirt sleeve professionals, will probably account for some $25 billion worth of different uh, power plant developments over the years. On our advisory board, we're very blessed to have Dr. Hazel Henderson and then also uh, Sir Edward Goldsmith and Pierre uh, Cousteau, uh, Jacques Cousteau's grandson, is in the process of joining our advisory board as well. Our, our agenda is to deploy uh, 500 kilowatt uh, by the fourth quarter of 2005, be the first to market with this commercial 250 kilowatt unit. And we see our capitalization coming primarily from the SRIs and then the strategic alliance partners, either Alcoa, GE, or Bechtel, and begin development of a basically a pilot project for the large scale in the 50 megawatt range and then get on with some of the, the larger uh, power projects. Our potential deal stream right now at Blue Energy prior to our first uh, uh, technology commercial trials is running right now some two to three billion dollars per quarter. And this kind of deal stream uh, quickly wins you the attention of, of these large interests. This is generally the distribution of where you'll find these tidal resources. I wish there was more in Southern California, but there isn't. Uh, Oregon starts to get quite interesting. You've got probably 15, 20,000 megawatts off the coast of Oregon, 25, 35,000 in, in Washington, and then probably 50,000 off the coast of British Columbia, and then perhaps 300,000 off the coast of Alaska. Uh, the Bay of Fundy, uh, we're all familiar with these very dramatic tides. But our system is not an amplitude dependent system. It works on the water column. So if we've got moving water and concentrated in inlets, uh, we can extract this, this, this uh, energy and convert it to useful mechanical power. <clears throat> we were also called by Senator Castama to, to, to see if we could provide a retrofit solution for the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And I hesitated in doing that, but we, we did finally spend about 200 engineering hours on it and found that we could indeed uh, cost effectively uh, retrofit the existing Tacoma Narrows Bridge and then provide them additional four lanes of traffic. Bechtel, uh, both our competitor and our also potential strategic lines partner, was proposing the twinning of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge for a cost of some $800 million. And the, the good folks up in the Olympic Peninsula were very much opposed to this uh, twinning project. They were opposed to it for a lot of reasons. A lot of them liked the lifestyle up there. There was a lot of environmental awareness, and they wanted this project stopped and were working vehemently to, to, to bring it to a halt. So we did a, a town hall meeting, basically showing a much similar presentation you're seeing here today. And almost 300 people attended this meeting. There was a lot of interest. And we won most of their support, I would say 98% of the people's support. The environmentalists uh, all agree and share uh, the principles of sustainability and see this as a, a necessary step that we have to make on the planet. Here's the market. We see four terawatts or a couple trillion dollars in market. Here's a multiple revenue stream. Here's our sales pro forma for five years. We're looking at about uh, three, 300 units over five years. And our capitalization will run somewhere between 250 and $400 million. The first round is $7 million. 75% of that will be provided by uh, grants from the Canadian government. And there's about 200 shareholders in Blue Energy right now and less than 10 million shares outstanding. In summary, we've got the world's most advanced ocean energy system, some uh, $300 million in intellectual property in the development of these hydrofoils. Uh, market ready, a going concern essentially from the third unit produced, a very short profit cycle time. An untapped trillion dollar market, international media exposure, strategic partnerships are pending, a very committed management team, an influential advisory board, and an attractive business case. It's our view that this is one of the biggest opportunities any of us will see in our lives. 
And Blue Energy is making a difference, and we invite you to make a difference with us. Thank you kindly. I think that was fascinating to to see the balance of excuse me to know that there are viable clean systems available I think is really important and we d we definitely support all these all these new technologies that can serve as bridges to uh, perhaps the the very simplistic and elegant systems that that we hope will be emerging soon. Our next speaker is certainly one of the elder researchers, pioneers, inventors in new energy technology. Dr. Wynne Lambertson is going to be talking about electromagnetic technologies and especially some of his own developments. And we recall yesterday some of the discussion, especially uh, I, I believe Tom Vallone had brought up about it's important that the information from some of these people who've spent years and years in this field, that, that that be carried on by the young people. And I'm really encouraged to see the turnout of students that we have here today. And, and please pay great attention to what this man has to say. Dr. Wynne Lambertson. Okay, <laughs> I'll use this one for a minute and then talk around. But before I get into electromagnetic technologies, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about a trip we made Friday to uh, Stonehenge. Can't see. How many people in this audience have ever seen the Stonehenge monument in uh, Washington. Oh my goodness, most of you. It, we went there with a uh, dazzler, and he, he dazzled the energy flow in it, and it was just extraordinary. Uh, Eileen, my wife Eileen and I could feel the, 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 uh, could feel the energy, and it was about parallel to the Earth's surface. And when you, when you think about the Earth rotating at about 1,200 miles an hour, you see this massive concrete and uh, steel reinforcing structure being really fast. So, the, uh, the energy seemed to go in a circle, except at the, uh, the center stone, uh, at any rate, in that case, the energy went parallel to the two long sides and parallel to the two short sides. So, I guess, I guess the point of, I'm trying to make is that the, uh, this is an excellent place to study, study energy. Now my, 
my thing is zero point energy. You, you've heard about, we just heard about hydro energy. This is the latest uh, modification of what I, we call an E dam for electricity dam. And uh, what we do is uh, pass a pulse DC square wave through this and then through a load in a circuit. This is a, the, the uh, best results we've, we've had on this is 153%, which uh, we, we should be able to. <laughs> when you think the environmental problem of burning coal and the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being spent to deal with the, the uh, CO2 pollution from burning coal, 50% would almost, almost take care of the problem. We could actually design a system to control or establish the world's uh, atmosphere. <laughs> Gentleman and a scholar. Thank you, sir. What I don't want to do is run over my time. At any rate, in the EDAM, the outside part, uh, there's a description of how we build this in the back there. The outer part, these are, this is wooden flooring and it holds the parts together. Now the, uh, there are two steel plates in there, and uh, then the, the white material is a diamagnetic material. And diamagnetic material will pass a magnetic wave easier or faster than air. So what we've done is form a magnetic bottle there. And uh, then a, a, a ceramic metal mixture called a cermet is placed on, uh, oh, before we get to that, the the steel plates are, uh, have inside them a uh, magnetic repulsion uh, plate. And so when electrons move, they give off a magnetic field. So what this does is it forces the, electron, the magnetic field to move to the outside and lets the electrons accelerate. The energy, the, the photons um, from, the, um, from the vacuum uh, will penetrate and, and uh, fasten themselves inside the electrons. And then, then when the electrons get to the load, they are slowed down and the, the photons come out as real energy. So we, that's 150%. Now, somebody yesterday said, well, we ought to have 300%. I think we ought to have 1,000%. <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny. <laughs> but what the heck, I'm 84 years old. I've spent 32, 32 years doing this. It's time to pass it on. That's what, what we've heard. Okay, so 
so uh, I'm seeking funded to scale this up. And uh, just like Brian O'Leary says, you, you take something so far, and then you scale it up, and this takes additional money. So we, we've been uh, seeking money for this. The uh, money story is interesting. What I do is work through what I call funding finders. And I spent two years with the first funding finder. And uh, I'm looking for a million dollars. And uh, what he, he found uh, sources of money, but they, uh, the investor would eventually put his money into a building as something more secure. Now, differently from Brian, I feel that something like this is a, it ought to be a, a PN commercial proposition. I don't see any point in giving my 32 years away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, uh, the second founder I, I worked with for three years, I uh, found two sources of money. The first uh, source of funds was the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church. And this, this guy all oh, had hundreds of millions of dollars. But when it came right down to it, he wanted a finished product. All right, what I have done is to develop a way to collect energy from the vacuum. So the next step is to make a, a product that you can make and sell, like the windmill story we just heard. You have to have something that you can make and sell. Now, the, the uh, anyway, the second finder, I spent three years with him, was uh, going to get me a million dollar grant. And a grant, that means that, that we could keep the company and have enough money to do the, the uh, development work for, for the uh, product to make and sell. Well then, uh, Dr. Greer, I, I contacted him. He said, make me three models of self-sustaining. We'll have them tested by independent people. And uh, if they think it's a good deal, we'll, we'll uh, fund your product. We'll find the money and fund your product. So that was unacceptable to me. He never did say how much he was going to take of this. But for an inventor, if an inventor can get 10% out of an invention, 10% of sales, this is about tops. But I'm now talking to a man who has uh, said that they would be satisfied with 20% of it. We would keep 80%, they would take 20%. That seems like a, a reasonable split to me. <laughs> but I'm the inventor, so I, that's what I'd like that. So that's where we are today. Then uh, I, have, I, have, I have three financial sources working. The second said, uh, bring your model down here and if we see an energy gain, we'll get you hundreds of millions without saying what the split would be, of course. That's two. All right, the third
Ozzy, all right? I've got the one million, hundreds of millions. I'm talking about on the come now. Nothing's happened, do you understand? But it's, uh, I can see th the investors. Oh, let me back up. I uh, knew a man who uh, was a uh, retired big wheel in the C uh, Central Intelligence Agency. And so I went to him and I said, well, how about, uh, selling this to the federal government. And uh, he said, don't waste your time. He said, if the federal government is going to uh, invest in uh, zero point energy, the first thing they'll do is set up a study committee. <laughs> and they'll study this for a couple of years and then if they like what they find, they'll ask Congress for the money. In a couple of years, they'll get their big money. And then uh, they will award a contract to some big organization that they, can go, that they can go to work for when they retire. So much for the, I don't see how the new energy movement can get a hundred million dollars from the government. So that leaves the private sector. And that's, the, and that's what I'm working. The new energy movement wants to start with a hundred million dollars. I want to start with one million dollars of private money. Now that's a more tractable goal, I think than, than uh, that of Brian's. Our goals also. Sir? <laughs> Our starting goals also are Is it, how much? A hundred million? No, no, one. one million. Okay, so Brian and I are at the same level there. But I have just one simple goal to uh, make a commercial device out of this. You're covering the universe. You can't think of anything that's not covered in your prospectus. So, with that, <laughs> I'll hush up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. These are in the back. Okay. Thank you, Wynn Lambertson. Uh, a copy of, of Wynn's EDAM construction certification paper for his device uh, is out uh, at the tables out here, I believe, or in the back. Thank you very much. Okay, hopefully I didn't destroy any of the electronics up here with that. Our next speaker, Ken Rowan, uh, has a unique perspective uh, in that he worked very, very closely with Eugene Malov, in whose memory the New Energy Conference is dedicated. And uh, Ken's actually going to speak on a, a couple different technology areas. And I think it's going to be fascinating to also hear about what his 
uh, working experience was with Dr. Eugene Maloff. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ken Rowland. All right, am I on? Yes. I've been asked to speak to you about the commercial potential of waterborne fusion and my heat engine research. Let's see, to find it on the computer here. Is this alive? I see nothing here. Press what? Oh, escape. There we go. Oh, we had a dead screen. And. thermodynamics at the bottom. Right there. Let's see if we have it running here. Print? Nope. Did it lock? The mouse is not moving. Locked up. Okay, we're running here. Well, I'm fairly new to this crowd, and you may not know who I am. So let's just uh, we get this to the next page. Uh-oh, <laughs> it's, it's still not firing. How do I advance this? The key isn't working. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm a chemist by education and an engineer by experience. And in 1990, I started my career in alternative energy with an inspirational event that occurred just two weeks before the invasion of Kuwait, which was August 2nd, 1990. And I saw that conflict that ensued in the Persian Gulf from a very different point of view, because what was revealed to me was a, a potential solution to the world's energy needs. So um, I worked on this idea for a couple of years and then decided it was time to seek public support for taking it further. And I approached the editor of Electrifying Times, which is in the, the back on one of the tables there, an electric vehicle periodical. And the editor sent me to Mark Goldis of Magnetic Power Incorporated in Sepasipal, California. I became good friends with him and his staff for a while, and they mentored me a little bit. And in 1995, Mark showed me a, a new curious magazine entitled Infinite Energy Magazine. So I subscribed to that magazine and quickly wrote a number of letters to the editor, to Gene Meloff, who ran the magazine, and I became friends with him. And in, uh, uh, just shortly after that, I went to visit him and uh, asked him about working in his new energy research laboratory, NERL, that they had just recently opened up soon after the magazine started. And eventually, a philanthropist came along who allowed the lab to expand to four people, and I was one of the four that was hired. So I spent a lot of time close to cold fusion in that laboratory, and my engine research was actually incorporated into the agenda of the, the research lab, and it went a fair ways along with it. So today's talk is uh, primarily to focus on the, the two areas that I can share a lot with, cold fusion and where it will go commercially, because Gene Malov said that Cold fusion is not going anywhere in the scientific community through publications and other things. It's just been dead since it started that way, despite the prolific evidence that it is real. And he says the only way to get it out there is through the marketplace. 
and that was the idea of the lab to make demonstration models and sell them. We never quite got that far, but we did uh, get to the bottom of some of the real good potentials for uh, what was called cold fusion and what uh, some people prefer to call waterborne fusion because it deals with water as the energy source uh, of hydrogen fusing into helium and releasing a tremendous amount of energy. I, was, I left the lab in 2002 for um, funding reasons because of a number of things that snowballed and the last straw was 9-11, which ironically killed our funding instead of increasing it like it should have been. So the lab was closed, I was laid off, but Gene couldn't stand to let my work go and he gave me a key to his house. I worked out of his basement unemployed, but basically self-employed, working for myself, continuing my research. And that was until last fall, early winter, when uh, things took a different, different turn for me, and uh, I was offered a job with Clean Energy Incorporated in Palo Alto, California. Issue number 51 of Infinite Energy Magazine covered the, the Joseph Papp noble gas engine. This is what I'm now working on. I've been hired as uh, director of research and development for this. And uh, the fellow who uh, convinced Gene to write those articles was Heinz Klosterman, and he's now my boss. And shortly after that issue came out last September, in November, issue number 52 was the summary of my research done on the engine thermodynamics at the lab, which uh, at the time that the magazines were being published, we couldn't say anything about it because it was proprietary information, but once uh, the lab was closed and there was an obvious dead end for its development at that time, Gene said, let's publish it, and I said, let's do it. And in March of this year, the U.S. Patent Office issued me a patent. Clear, free and clear for, contrary to the U.S. Patent Office's uh, time-honored administrative policy of no perpetual motion machines, they liked my science that I presented along with it, and they said, sounds legitimate to me. Here, have at it. The funny thing is that uh, our patent attorney at that time, uh, from, I stole some words from uh, the movie uh, The Princess Bride where uh, Billy Crystal says to uh, the big galoot who's going to go up to uh, go after the, the king's castle, he says, have fun storming the castle, boys. And that's basically what I said to my patent attorney because we were really going into uh, new territory there. Okay, into fusion, waterborne fusion. I see several potentials and really only one clear winner that's out there. What I have known as sonofusion, what some others are calling uh, sonocavitation. It's using ultrasonic agitation to stimulate the reaction for hydrogen to fuse into helium. How many of you know what ultrasonic jewelry cleaners are? Now you have a, a good idea of the starting point, the technological starting point for this process. And actually, the inventor of this process, Roger Stringham in Hawaii, started off with one of, his one of his early reactors was actually cut out of the mechanism from a stainless steel ultrasonic bath. And uh, Roger's work has been uh, encapsulated into a corporate structure known as uh, First Gate Energy, and its CEO is right here in Portland, Dick Raymond. Will you please stand so that everybody knows who you are? It's a, a serious and a live entity around here. But it, it's still, still really, a, like Brian says, still in the, the research end of things and not quite, it's getting close to that knee of the curve to start going up. Uh, the science is fairly well forward. The technology is quite robust at this point, but has lots of room to move. And uh, just recently, Roger received patents for his stuff without saying anything about cold fusion. The patent office doesn't like that. and they'll. They'll kill it as quick as can be. But the corporation is ready to start moving. You know, they've even set up a business structure around it, and uh, Dick is looking for corporate partners to assist with this. Right now it's still, excuse me? 
it is First Gate Energies Incorporated. And you, Dick will stick around afterwards and you can talk with him. He'll be here this evening. Um, I also see other potentials in there, but much dimmer. John Dash with his, uh, these other three ones that I have on the page here are all based on the Pons and Fleischmann original process of electrolysis, taking basically a beaker of water, with DC electricity, and splitting the water apart. Hydrogen goes to one electrode, oxygen to another, but at the, the hydrogen electrode, the cathode, it absorbs right into the metal, and funny things happen that plasma physics can't explain, and uh, it looks like we have to extend solid state physics to accommodate that. And uh, the mainstream science doesn't want to look at it. Plasma physics, that's the only way you can do fusion. Come on now. You know, solid state physics uh, doesn't, uh, or plasma physics does not explain the vacuum tube, and they had to develop solid state physics to uh, explain the, the transistor. And it's the same thing with cold fusion. Uh, within the electrolytic processes, John Dash has a fairly reliable process, but it's still very small power output. It's teeny. They might be able to go somewhere with it, but I think it's a ways off. I know John is here. I need to mention it to him because we liked his work when at New Energy Research Lab, but it's still very tiny, and uh, it may be years off for that. Letts and Cravens used an electrolysis process with a laser, which they were able to turn the excess heat on and off within a minute or so that the heat was coming right through the water. Very repeatable, and that's been one of the problems with, with cold fusion. Repeatability and also the size of the output. And uh, Sonofusion, I think, is licking the size of the output, and I'll show you some information on that in more detail afterwards. Uh, there's also uh, uh, Mitchell Schwartz in the Boston area who, with his JET process that's uh, very proprietary. He's he wants to keep a lid on the information, but he was a very close friend of Gene Malov. And Gene used to tell me in private, boy, I really like what Mitch is doing. It's just terrific. He may have the electrolytic process uh, licked. He might have something really commercial here. But because of the non-disclosure agreement he has with Mitch, Gene couldn't give me any details. But this is uh, secondhand from, uh, from Gene's mouth. There are other processes. Uh, I don't know them, and just to be fair, I want to say that this isn't all that there is. There may be others. Now, outside of the waterborne fusion, there's another category which I think is very important to mention, and that is uh, two things here. Less case has a catalytic process that works with gas. And uh, you'll see a, a slide on this later on from uh, NERL when we were doing some replication of his work. It's also another area that I think is very fascinating that has been a, uh, an attribute, an artifact of cold fusion that appears that the solid matrix, the, the material in which the, the solid state fusion is taking place, is altering the metals that host this operation. There have been transmutation of these metals. And I see a potential here for synthetic metals. I don't think anybody's ever addressed this or paid attention to it. For example, converting calcium into chromium. How about uh, converting tungsten into platinum? These are very real possibilities for the science that's already been established through Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, where they're using more obscure elements. This was the very first issue of Infinite Energy magazine, the one that first caught my attention, and that is Roger Stringham with his uh, sono cavitation, one of his early sono cavitation devices there, an ultrasonic piezoelectric device here that puts very high pressure sound waves into the, the water cavity. And these are palladium foils which were mounted inside of this and exposed to the sound waves. And you can see they were actually burned and melted. Palladium melts at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and this was only a one thousandth of an inch thick foil, like aluminum foil. How could that possibly melt? Those were fusion reactions that were doing that. And microscope analyses of it showed volcanic, not only melting, but apparent vaporization and volcanic eruptions of this. We're quite sure that these really were fusion events. This is uh, diagrammatically, very simplistically, what uh, a reactor looks like. Uh, the ultrasonic transponder here, the piezoelectric stack, and then a structure to hold the foil between gaps of 
heavy water, which is, uh, produces the, has the right material for hydrogen to fuse into helium. And this is a, a step by step sequence of cavitation bubbles that occur from the very high pressure sound waves that create pressure and rarefaction. And on the rarefaction wave, it's actually causing the water to boil. But this is at ultrasonic frequencies higher than you can hear, 20,000 cycles per second and higher. And lately, Roger has done some work where he's been up in the megahertz range to do this. But a cavitation bubble starts very small, gets bigger and bigger. And then when the pressure increases, it collapses non-uniformly so that there's a central plume that shoots down the middle and hits the, the metal side of the reactor with extremely high speed. And it's been uh, clocked with high speed photography to be somewhere in the neighborhood of a tenth of the speed of light. That's a plasma that's hitting that. This is one of Roger's original reactors that was taken on by NERL and put inside a calorimeter, a heat measuring instrument that we were able to measure the amount of heat given off. Electrical energy was put into this to run the piezos and then that was dissipated as heat plus whatever fusion was taking place inside the reactor. I redesigned that and rebuilt this in the smaller reactor with the intention of going commercial for a commercial kit that could be readily handled by many people. And this is a view of the inside of it where it's taken apart. And these are the piezoelectric stacks that are always used in pairs facing each other to produce extremely high sound pressure level. When, it's, this is, when the water is unpressurized, it can reach 194 decibels. And this is the piezo stack seen from the side and electrical connections are applied to it. And it vibrates like crazy when it the electricity, the alternating currents put to it. We did some testing of these piezo stacks and sent a few of them to Roger, some of our designs to Roger, and he got excess heat from them after our lab closed. This was a, a reactor that I made out of plexiglass so I could see some of what was going on. And these, uh, this is the inside of one of Roger's reactors, and actually this with uh, plastic support around it was actually cut out of uh, an ultrasonic bath. One of our test benches with a computer data acquisition system, some control electronics, and the, the green calorimeter box is over here on the side. The right side, we can see a much better view of the calorimeter box and more control electronics. Bottle of argon to pressurize it so we could make some changes. This is what the electrical signal looked like on the oscilloscope. It was bursts of power. And from this, it was my estimate, because this was only pulsed and not continuous, the 10% excess heat that I verified I extrapolated to, we can probably get a 30 to 1 over unity ratio from this process. This is recent data that Roger and his, uh, and his son-in-law acquired this summer in their research lab in Hawaii. And there's a, a linear correspondence here of, uh, of uh, sonoluminescence, actually an optical output that's been known about water cavitation for over 100 years, and a correlation to the excess heat output. This is over and above the electrical energy that was put into it. Now, this is uh, relatively how much excess heat was put in. If everything converted all the electricity into heat, it would be along this line of one here. We're out in this category here. This is over unity, roughly 50% excess heat. And what they've seen so far was the higher the power they put into it, the more excess heat they got out of it. This will be presented at the 11th International Conference on Cold Fusion in Marseille, France at the end of October. Now, this is a reactor of uh, less case that was at NERL. And it's a, a very large vessel here that, uh, if we got it to fire, which we didn't, could produce kilowatts of excess heat. And it would run by itself with no input on its own. Just heat would trigger it to operate. Uh, Les is one of these secretive inventors, and I'm under a non-disclosure and can't say anything more about it. But I think he really has something there that, if he chose to get support, it could go a long ways. This was uh, a month before the laboratory closed. One of our potential investors snapped this picture of the two of us. And I'm very fond of this picture because I was very close to Gene. And uh, he was supposed to be the keynote speaker of this, this conference, and he couldn't make it. And so I took the, uh, the effort to be here for what I could to speak in his behalf is from spending Nearly every day with him for most of four years, I'm confident that I can speak his mind and what he wanted to say here. Awesome. 
After I left the laboratory, Gene gave me the key to his house, as I said. This is down in his basement, where I worked there for a year doing a number of projects. Um, my area of specialization is in thermodynamics, in heat engine and heat pump design. Uh, this was, just because I have a picture of it, this is uh, an enclosure for a Tesla turbine that I built to characterize it, see what it would do. This is what it looks like without the cover plate attached, and a close-up of uh, the inlet of the, the turbine where you can see the plates, and this is spinning at high speed right now. But from here, I want to take this into the more serious area of work that I want to introduce to you, where I am challenging the, second law, the universality of the second law of thermodynamics. And my research has not only been uh, in actually building a first prototype, which unfortunately didn't work because of mechanical engineering problems, not because of the science. I have taken this to such a point where I now have a US patent. I have nine mathematical proofs that Carnot and the second law of thermodynamics can be exceeded. Several of these have been reviewed by three science university professors, one at the University of Detroit, one at MIT, and one at the University of San Diego, uh, University of California at San Diego. They have not been able to find any flaws in my stuff. And to paraphrase what uh, the senior thermodynamics professor said at the University of Detroit in 1992 when I gave him my first mathematical proof, I don't find any flaw in your math, but this goes against everything that I have ever learned and have been teaching for 20 years. <laughs> Thermodynamics is the science, uh, the scientific discipline that deals with the interaction of heat and work. And though thermodynamics is a mature science, it is not closed, contrary to what people think. They think it's done. No, there, there is evidence that we are still learning I don't have enough time to go into that today, but anyone who wants to talk with me afterwards is welcome to. There are things that the scientific community has not recognized only because they're not capable of seeing this. They just say, no, no, something's wrong. Yes, what's wrong is uh, their attitude. Now, as a short overview of <laughs> classical thermodynamics, uh, it really was started in the early 1800s with that famous French engineer by the name of Sadi Carnot. Um, he really was, the, he started saying, hey, there's a limit to how much work you can get out of a heat engine. And then uh, a few years later, James Jewell, with his famous uh, uh, water barrel of, uh, you know, a wooden barrel of water with some paddles in it, and the mechanical energy that was put in to stir the water was translated into a rise in temperature of the, of the water. So, oh, there's, there's a, a correlation between heat and work. That became known as the, as the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. A number of years later, people were saying, well, yeah, there's, it goes, it's equal back and forth, but it tends to go one way. Uh, work can be very readily converted into heat, but you can't, you have a real darn hard time, and we don't know of any examples where you can convert all heat into work. And that became known as the second law of thermodynamics, which is described as the nature of entropy or a description of the randomness of energy. Energy tends towards randomness. I say, well, that's not completely true. The universe has been highly complex and structured for a long, long time, and I don't see it as decomposing. There's something else that we still do not yet know. Now, uh, the implications of classical thermodynamics, mostly through the first and second laws, is that perpetual motion machines are supposedly impossible. There are three different kinds. Perpetual motion machine of the first kind, second kind, and third. The first kind, violates the first law of, of thermodynamics and basically says, you can't win. The second law of violation says, you can't even break even. And then the, the third says, well, all right, uh, they, are, they do exist, but you can't do anything useful with them. An example is a superconducting ring. Electrons circle forever and ever and don't stop, but they say, but what can you do with it? But when the third law was recognized, they hadn't thought about implications, which our field in other ways is looking into and saying, well, superconductors might do something. Out of, uh, out of all of this, uh, there was a, an equation that came out, and this is the most technical stuff I'm going to give you, that uh, the maximum engine efficiency relates to the highest and lowest temperatures of the engine, and it's always less than one, and usually much, much less. And there has to be a high temperature input, uh, a low temperature output, and therefore, because of that, the heat of the environment is unavailable for doing useful work. And I say that's not true. 
Now, the, the uh, classical thermodynamics has limitations. It's all based upon the kinetic theory of heat, the idea that heat is actually the vibration of uh, particles, atoms, and molecules that compose matter. The hotter something is, the more they're vibrating around. And that uh, those collisions, the bouncing back and forth, are elastic. The energy is not lost. It's always there. And, uh, and those uh, collisions and transfers of energy, have a, it's a distribution. Not all of them are moving at the same speed. And there's a, a statistical description of it, which uh, we come to know in, in universities as statistical mechanics. And the second law of thermodynamics is based upon all of this stuff, but it's not the total limitation of things. Uh, to say that something is impossible, like the, the perpetual motion machine attitudes, is illogical. In order to say that something is impossible, you must know everything. And I say that omniscience is not a human trait. That's as close as I come to a statement of impossibility. <laughs> so out of this, uh, a lot of people, a lot of practitioners in science, the scientists, have hubris or false pride, of which they know a lot, but they mistakenly assume that they know everything. And a lot of them are not willing to take a look at my work. Now, I just, uh, I've had this stuff going for, since 1990, but Wayne Prohl came up through Gene, a book landed in our laps at the lab, written by Wayne Prohl called the the engineering, the, the thermodynamic design and engineering design of uh, super Carnot heat engines or something like that. I read the book and found a, uh, found a, a nugget of gold amidst uh, the big pile of dirt. And uh, decided to go ahead with uh, some research on this and got positive results. Now, through all the years, for everything that Gene Malov was ever exposed to, there are only three things that in his personal uh, confidence with me that he thoroughly believed in not only was real but could be made useful and commercialized. Cold fusion, Paulo and Alexandra Correa's ether technology, and my work. I'm not kidding, that's really what he said. Just for example, this is the, the famous or infamous Carnot cycle plotted as four cycle points around a loop and the, the dark area is actually the, the network of the cycle as plotted pressure as a function of volume. And these curves are constant temperature lines. This is the Stirling cycle, which many uh, alternative energy people have been playing with, trying to tap solar energy and other things uh, as an external combustion type engine. This is a disc one disc mechanical embodiment of a Stirling engine it came from a patent drawing, which has two pistons, a power piston and a displacer which separates a hot side and a cold gas side uh, connected by a passage known as a regenerator, which can transfer heat. And to transfer linear motion into rotational motion, this mechanism just shows actually a, a cam and cam follower system on this flywheel as opposed to the, the typical crank motion. And the utility of that will show up in a minute. Uh, basically, the Prohl effect, as I coined it, and published it in this magazine with experimental results of, uh, of uh, the second law is not universal, is that uh, heat can be transferred by these vibrations from under the right conditions from a low, if you want to think of it artistically this way, heat, the higher I put my hand, the higher the temperature. These vibrations can occur one after another from low temperature to high temperature without any energy input. And that is what I have experimentally verified which is classified as a Maxwell's demon. This is a simplistic description of the constant volume process, which is part of the Stirling cycle, where there's a dis displacer piston plug here in a sealed chamber of gas. And this is 50 degrees C, which is about 120 Fahrenheit. And when the displacer moves up, it will push the air through this regenerator, which has a temperature gradient on it, 50C at the top, 20C at the bottom. And when it comes out the other end here, the gas is actually below the lowest temperature of the regenerator, like 15 degrees C. That's self-refrigeration. The opposite direction, when the displacer goes down and pushes the gas up to the hot side, the gas actually gets hotter than the very hottest temperature of the regenerator. It'd get up to like 55 degrees C. And I incorporated this into this 
repeatable tester, which was published. This is an entirely, this is an hermetically sealed chamber with magnetically coupled uh, controlling ring here that lifts, lower, raises and lowers a displacer piston inside, which is constructed this way of a hollow plastic tube. And these are coupling magnets across the top. When you look at it from the side, this is filled with steel wool in here, and it all slides very nicely into this two inch PVC tube with uh, very fine thermocouples inside of it that can very quickly register changes in temperature. This is the experimental results that I got from uh, raising it to, to uh, cause self-refrigeration, cooling, and then uh, lowering it back again a few seconds later to get uh, self-heating. And this was all on the cold side of the, the device at room temperature. This was very cold at that time in winter in New Hampshire in an unheated room. 16 de degrees C, which is in the upper 50s in Fahrenheit. And this is one of numerous control tests that were done so that we knew exactly what it was that we were seeing. The effect was clearly an on or off situation and it was very well spelled out. With computer data acquisition systems, here's another test of a different device, but same concept, where the self-refrigeration of several degrees C persisted for minutes as opposed to seconds. And that's only because of heat that flows back and forth. Here's the very first test that I did, and it probably doesn't show up very well, but this was room temperature in a very hot day in May of 2000, 24.3 degrees C. And uh, there's the upper temperature heated by a resistance heater, 47. And this is through the top plate of this very first test that was done. There's the, the displacer piston, the regenerator made of straws here, and some resistance heaters here. This is, you can see the, the piston's up on top now on the hot side, so everything's down on the cold side. That's below room temperature, and that should not happen according to classical thermodynamics. And so I've incorporated this into an engine design, which is now patented, which I call the super classical cycle. And it's super because it exceeds the Carnot limit. It's classical because it, uh, it involves all classically known engine processes, except the constant volume process has been reanalyzed according to Prohl and me. And it's now patented, and there's the number. This is what that cycle looks like under similar conditions to the other ones. It's a three-step process, expansion, self-refrigeration, cooling, and compression. And under the right circumstances, all of the waste heat of the engine can be recycled, and it goes back to the highest temperature of the engine. And this is why it, that Sterling looks so strange. This is, my, this is out of my patent. This is the power piston, the displacement. This is actually the heat input side, not the, the heat output or waste side. The heat goes into here from the environment, from the room. Goes through its process and what's left over here on the cold side gets sucked into the, re into the regenerator to be reused the next cycle. This can be at liquid nitrogen temperatures in here and actually I came close to that. Okay, that for comparison, that's the Sterling cycle. I'll quickly just go through some laboratory photographs, and I don't have time to give details of it, but this was my first prototype that I built, and it had mechanical problems. I'm only a chemist by education, and here I am uh, doing cutting-edge thermodynamics research on my own. You can see the channels cut in the flywheel and some small DC electric motors used as starters and potential generators, heat fins to pick up heat from the room, which unfortunately never happened. This is the inside of it, the power piston, the displacer, closer view, a side view, and there's the bottom of the displacer, which includes the regenerator in its entire structure, and this is part of my patent. Inside of that is tightly packed steel wool as the regenerator, and it's wearing a winter coat because it's supposed to get very cold. Here's another regenerator type that's packed with uh, Dunkin' Donuts uh, coffee stirrer straws and a bank of resistors so I could know exactly how much heat was going into the engine. Here's another uh, displacer arrangement where you can see right through one pack of those straws. A set of round drinking glass straws, another type, and some stainless steel screen that I also use for another regenerator type. Here it is with a winter coat and uh, thermocouple measurements to see what's going on inside the engine. Here's actually an operation where I was trying to start it with some liquid nitrogen. You can see the frosty air coming off of it because the engine actually has to have a temperature difference across it and the temperature difference goes the other way. Instead of getting hot, it has to be cold. So we trade named this 
uh, a cold engine. These are other versions of the interior structure of it, and uh, one of the latest versions we had, it was all incorporated in this steel canister, and then we could put a, a bucket, a, a doer bucket of uh, liquid nitrogen underneath it, and you can see the frost coming out from the vapor. But it had problems, and yes, that engine is in the intensive care unit. That uh, tent is to keep moisture out of it, and it's just dry nitrogen that's in there. I had problems with the seals, and air was getting into the engine and causing condensation and frost. It was very highly instrumented, and this data acquisition display here just gives you an idea of how much measurement was done on this. This is a very key piece of data here. This is a pressure fluctuation of when it was running, and this tells me two things. Oops, I have a pressure problem. There's a, a piston seal leak here. Pressure's changing. And three-step process as a review, expansion, self-refrigeration, compression. Now from the, the pressure curves here, expansion, self-refrigeration, compression. It's doing exactly what I want to do, but it's not doing enough to overcome its own friction. So it was uh, stillborn, so to speak. But uh, from this, uh, whenever the second law is not universal, and when it doesn't apply, it's because it's not bounded by a, the kinetic theory of heat doesn't describe what's going on, or when the particle collisions occur uh, over larger distances than what's statistically allowed, and that's the, the operative point here. Uh, conventional thermodynamics is off, and it doesn't work. And uh, as I've told somebody else, uh, I've discovered a whole new continent to explore. So uh, to understand all of this, there are prerequisite beliefs to accept all of this. Heat's a perpetual form of energy. The second law has never been proven as universal. And multiple energy transformations are possible. Energy doesn't have to be used once and thrown away. It is perpetual. So by deductive logic, the Prohl effect is real. It creates a spontaneous separation of heat. When, that, when one of these constant volume processes is incorporated into an engine cycle, Carnot's out the window, therefore perpetual motion machines are possible, and the heat of the environment is available to run heat engines. This is the benign source of energy that Brian is looking for. Thank you, Ken. That was great. Uh, any of you who have been following the program know that we're, we're quite a, a ways behind, but um, I have exercised the discretion that as these presentations have been very fascinating that we've, we've extended that time, and I, I think you'd agree that it's well worth it. It's why we're here. <laughs> uh, we will adjourn for uh, until 5.15, please be back at that time though. Partake of the displays, the cold fusion experiment of John Dash and his students uh, back along the side here. Uh, but please do be back at 515. Thank you very much. <laughs>